been a while uh, since uh, all of us met here in Pune, and I guess that's the reason that the turnout is a little bit less. I think people are just used to not coming down. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Last time also I did this at the end. I'm uh, Mano Arya. I work with the World Disney Company as a producer. I am working with the Disney Interactive Division. I make uh, games for smartphones. And uh, I've been doing this for a while. I've made some games on the PS2, PSP, Xbox 360, PS3, DS. No, not too much, but yeah, <laughs> I've been around. So. I have, I have been in Pune for a while, I used to work with Jump Games before, I shifted to Bombay a while ago, so I have a big connection with the city, I make sure that I always come down for these meetups and I host them. So today uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, an old friend Rudra, he's going to be talking along with Amog and Vijay from SQS. Okay, so I'd like all of you guys to please you know, ask as many questions as you want. You've gotten them down so that you know you can get an insight to what they do for a living. I know uh, a lot of you might be students, so don't feel shy. You know, I'm around. <laughs> you can uh, you can tell me to ask questions if you want <laughs> as well. So I think uh, we'll not wait much longer. I think we'll uh, make Rosa start with this presentation. Yeah, it's the, it's the same thing. Uh, it's an inherent part of game production. I feel because. We're just so busy with our lives, with production, and it's just so difficult. But, uh, you know, one thing I've learned over time is uh, you should definitely take time out to come and meet your peers and, you know, just just relax and talk about what you're up to. You know? There's no hostile environment here. I don't think uh, anybody is in anybody's direct competition per se. I mean, there's the fishbowl is big enough for all of us to accommodate. Maybe in the next five, six years, let's see. Let it get saturated. Competition is always good, right? <laughs> so, that's always good. <coughs> so, that's there and uh, hopefully we'll be having the next uh, IGDA meetup at the NASCOM conference that happens, now happens in Pune every year because it's been very successful. So, TK, I'll, I'll I just wanted to add that the IGDA is a really big body. I was in the US for about 10 years and... Uh, oh, it's fine. So I was in the US for about 10 years and IGD is really big over there in Europe. People don't know what it is, but uh, it's a non-profit international body that is uh, that, uh, that helps game developers and is, uh, is there to help out all you know people who are getting into the industry. There's only you know training institutes and companies. But there's no body that actually takes care of the game industry and tries to spread knowledge. And that's where the IGDA comes in. It sort of is non-existent or very little existence in India. But don't underestimate uh, what they can do. The point I want to pitch in and Manav has been, you know, the coordinator here is if you get together then you can share more knowledge under the IGDA. So it's a very useful body. My talk is meaningless about it right now. At this point, three years out, you'll see what it is. Anyway, uh, I'll get started. So... Uh, founder of a small game startup called Seven Levels, and I'm here in Pune. I uh, moved back and started up, and we do sort of original IP small games for you know improving your lives or improving your health and fitness or just lifestyle. Uh, and I'm more interested in creating IP and interesting ideas than anything else. So today I thought uh, I give you a primer on game prototyping. I'm not here to give you some original Gyan. Uh, the way I view it is at the end of this talk, I'll share material on the NASCOM Facebook uh, forum. How many of you guys are on that? Is everyone on that? So what I'll do is the talk, uh, it's more of a talk and not a presentation firstly. We can have Q&A later. Secondly, the material in this is gleaned from three or four articles of the web which are excellent. Uh, and I'll post that so you can go dig in and so you have more homework to do. So let's start. Um, we have about. Manav, just tell me when we are running out of time, okay? So the agenda. See, so the agenda is you know talk about what game prototypes are, lazy man's approach. Uh, then I want to talk about what kind of prototypes you can make, code versus content. 
um, when to use the content once, and when do you prototype in code. I think, uh, I don't know, a lot of people <coughs> assume that prototypes are always in code, but that's not true. And of course, then talk about they're not, because then there's a risk and danger in it. And then what do you want to accomplish with prototypes? Uh, game production is riddled with problems, risks, issues, screw ups, over budgets, and prototypes is one way to solve this. And so you have to be aware of what you know you can do with it and you cannot, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So that's the agenda. So let's get started. So what is a game prototype? Now, can anyone volunteer a definition on you know, what they think or no prototypes? Anyone? Easy one. No right answer. A vertical slice. There's no right answer, but you could have it as a vertical slice, a test of a concept, a bunch of things where we just want to validate your ideas. Yeah. It can be based on whatever you want it to be for a particular requirement. Yeah, that sounds good. Anyone else? Students? Not reading about prototypes? Don't know what that is? Well, you should know what it is. So, quite simply, it's just a piece of code, something that is built very quickly. And it is just a piece. It's not a game, it's not anything. Uh, and it's just built very quickly and it answers a specific question. And we'll get to what these questions are. So you have ideas like, let's make this cool game. And what you want to do with the prototype, the goal is that you want to make sure that it actually works, you know? Oh, I want to make this cool moving, you know, move your tablet, accelerometer, mobile game and it's going to be awesome, it's going to be speedboat racing and you think it's great in your head but you don't know if it will actually work. Guess what, a lot of times it gets screwed up and it doesn't come out the way you thought it was and that's six months out. So that's what it is for. You know, It's made during pre-production, you do it early, you test ideas, you know, you get the risks out. Okay. And basically to cut the risk down because you're not building something you didn't want and you get to the fun part because sometimes you build stuff that's not fun. And above all, you just want to make better games. Simple. Nothing complicated. Any questions so far? Okay, moving on. So this is something I want to talk about. This I found very interesting when I come upon this <coughs> idea. And when you prototype, you don't always have to write code. You can break it up. Right? So there's one kind of prototype. This is what most people are familiar with. And it's basically a part of a game or a little mechanic that you want to try out, you code up, you script, and, and you make it work. And of course, that is interactive because you can play with it. And uh, you know, it, it sh it's functional, it shows you how things work, right? And that's the example is code and script. But there's other ways to prototype, mm -hmm. but it's called a content prototype. And that's basically screenshots, artwork, a collage, anything you can put together cheap, very cheaply, quickly. Just to get the idea across that, hey, uh, I'm doing a shooter, should I do top-down view or front-facing view? Or if you're doing an endless runner and, you know, tempered run kind of game, you want it sideways, top-down. So you can quickly put it together because you don't want to have them miss the mark to visually validate it. And the response to this, again, is emotional, you know, does it feel right? The response to this is, does it function right? You know, is it interactive correctly? So you always have to remember that you have two choices. In fact, you should use both the choices when you're trying to prototype or put a concept together. So let me talk about, uh, any questions about this? Any Anything that is not clear about content, prototypes, or code? Is that? It can be a Photoshop image, it can be a drawing, paper, anything you want. Uh, it's artwork, you know. Uh, you take screenshots, you've copied, pasted stuff. Basically, it's not code. So you just said, I want the game to look like that. It's just a mock. It, the mock does nothing. It feels like it does nothing because it's static, but it actually does a lot of stuff to help people conceptualize in your head. So you should do that. We'll talk about how that works. So when do you want to use a content prototype? So when you start out and you say, OK, I want to do this submarine racing game, you know, you haven't thought out everything, right? or at least you don't know that you haven't thought out. And you're at a conceptual level, and you want to take in approaches and see if it's good. That's not the time to start coding an endless runner or doing the coding. That's the time you want to do a content prototype. You want to assemble images, you want to put stuff together. Okay? And you show it with the team. Now, I'm presuming you work in a team environment, you're not a lone coder. 
if you are uh, like a mad genius then that's good this can be done in your head uh, but most of us are doing teamwork so don't underestimate the power or the the damage you can do by presuming things in your head and not putting it on paper so go through it that's when you do it when you are still at an open stage and you want to throw the idea out and you want to capture the central idea what is the idea of the game that's when you want to do content prototype you're doing artwork you're cutting pasting you're stealing you know and then you want to play with suggestions why because this takes like half a day to put together not 8 weeks to write a code so you say do we have a top down are we doing it in 3d what does it look like but it's important to put it together and present it and think about it and capture it yeah and also it's done when the feedback you need is visual right does it feel right does it look right and that's why you have the markups and the screens <laughs> not everything can be captured visually and not every uh, not everything can be done in code so there's you need to understand where code is like ui design you don't need to build the ui you can just snap it together and okay all about the game mechanics which you are going to be doing in game yeah so that is done by code prototypes right let's get to that can we do it in a content prototype game mechanics so what i mean by content is something that is not static how will you test a mechanic and you either have to have it function the word mechanic by itself means that it moves it functions right it's not a rock it's, it's a machine which means either you're doing it in your head you're doing it on paper by moving dice you know rolling dice and doing stuff or you're writing code but it interacts with you right and that's what code prototypes are <coughs> that's what i mean so like i said you now know that okay this is a game and we're going to do swiping you know i'm going to play the game with swiping now you think that's a cool thing right and you have a key mechanic and you need to test it that's when you do a code prototype so that's second thing is you you understand the problem that okay i'm doing this swiping game or i'm going to do this tilt game and i don't know how it will feel or to respond right so you understand the problem you have a mental model and now you want to test it that's when you get into code you don't get into code straight up saying okay let's assume everything and then most importantly you can the reason you do this is the only way you can get knowledge is by someone you actually interacting with the prototype okay. so why you prototype in code if you can get this knowledge without coding don't make it the cheapest prototypes are the ones that are not made they're just in your head it's good cheap if you can but it doesn't work that way sometimes you need to write the code right? this is the bare minimum code you write to test the swipe mechanic or the movement of the tablet or your controller or your control scheme and that doesn't mean I'm, you're building the game you're just building the core bits that will help you test it right? and you can play it help play test you know you can give get feedback so just code enough so you can play test with people they'll imagine the rest in their heads right so this is what i mean so only spend code when you need to develop understanding it's only for understanding for everything else make content that means make mock ups drawings fake it you know let people pretend or imagine their head don't build it because the point is time and effort and the point is you need to get the understanding so you're breaking up the entire problem animation separate ui separate mechanics separate uh aesthetics and other things separate sound music separate when you break things down uh each of them individually are simpler and smaller to achieve conversely like a game when a game is put together it's many systems put together so the complexity of that is going to be not twice or thrice or four times higher it's 10 times higher it's not when you take two systems and you put them together it's not twice the complexity it actually is orthogonal so it actually becomes quadruple at many times right and this is exactly where prototypes come in when you break it up and you say i have two separate little pieces i can quickly put up and test them separately and i will think about it in my head so this is a interesting diagram i got off the internet and i love this diagram is is obviously the cost versus quantity and where you want to use that now does anyone have any questions around the diagram when i for explain it does it make sense to you or does it make sense to you okay whoever thinks this is 
it just looks obvious to them, raise your hands. Okay, so it's not obvious to everyone. Okay, great. So now I'll explain. So what happens is you start to make a game, and a game is art, design, code, all of that put together. Okay. And you're trying to understand if this game is viable, it's going to be fun, it's going to be worth it, it's going to be hit, it's going to be all that stuff. So you have to then decide, okay, I'm going to break up this game into a set of prototypes or mock-ups and design documents and see if I can A, actually pull it off, B, plan and execute around it. So if you look at this curve, it's the cost. Right? Now when you're looking at code, when you're trying to do a prototype, right, the cost is uh, with code initially is very high, but then it goes down eventually. But initially, when you're trying to code something on a game, like the game engine, the animation system, you, all the price is up front, right? So you have to pay an entire price before you start seeing, reusing the system. Content, on the other hand, is linear. If I don't like the character, I'll make a new character. If I don't like the UI, I'll make a new one. It costs the same throughout, right? So you need to understand, when you understand these two curves, you know what you need to do. So you break up your game, and it says, I need to know well, I need to understand how the art style will be or the backgrounds will be. But it always costs the same amount of time to make different backgrounds. So take that part of the game and make it a content prototype. You know that if you need to put a game engine together, it's going to cost you a lot. right? So that's why this is where your code prototypes come in, where you break this up. You know, Don't make a game engine. Don't make an animation engine. Just write the code for the mechanic. Right? So this is the trade-off between code and content. We'll come back to this uh, later, but does that make sense? It makes sense. So you need to know where you need to put your prototypes based on that. Okay? And this m means that you decompose the entire game and you use it in the best possible manner. Okay? So let me talk a little bit of, how are we doing on time? Will we be okay? Okay, good. So what prototypes are not? Now this is, it's important to understand that as well because what happens is you start out and I've seen this with myself. I'm like, I know the game. Let's just build it. I mean, there's nothing stopping me. I just jump on the computer. We'll start building the, you know, bringing this thing together, start doing the animation and we just build it and be done. Why think, why plan, why decompose, why do all this stuff in your head and you know, grind yourself down. But there's a good reason. Before I go that, I want to define what prototypes are not. You're not doing something that is going to last for eternity or be a showcase of your genius, okay? Or it's going to be elegant or optimized. That means you're writing fast, dirty code. You're copying, <coughs> you're taking ideas, you're just slapping stuff together. You're using any tool you can to show the idea. You can use Game Maker to show, test one mechanic. You can use Unity for another. There's no rules, there's no integration required. So they have to be made cheap and they have to be made rapidly. If it's taking four weeks to test it, you've got something wrong, break it down, break the problem down. Or do the research, get the right tool, you're not using the right tool, you're missing the point. Okay. Also with content, it's not intricate, it's not showing how beautiful the animation is, how fluid it is and all that. Okay. Uh, it's not detailed, it's not polished. Okay, if it's any of this, it's not a prototype, you're missing the point. You're starting to build the game. You're wasting your time eventually. That's why we have something called as pre-production. How many of you guys are aware of pre-production? Okay. So you have to understand why they do pre-production. It's almost like you know doing a lot of the work and throwing most of that work away. That's you know to some people outside the game industry it might look like that. It's waste. But it's done. And it's a smart way to do it. So obviously you, you want to fake it, beg, borrow, steal, plagiarize, look at other marks, you know, see, you know, in this game it was done this way, here's one thing, what if we marry this, these two things together. So that's what you really want to do here. No one's going to look at your code, no one's going to steal it, it's not going to go outside the four walls. So who cares, right? It's not multifaceted, it's not this beautiful solution that will be a panacea or solve all your problems. If it is, it's not a prototype, you miss the point. You screwed up. Also, it is not a demo and this is not a vertical slice. Because if it is a vertical slice, it will be multiple features stacked on top of each other and that's what it is not. Which means you already spent too much time building it. Okay. And it doesn't help you break the problem down. 
the fact that you're building just one uh, one piece of code is that you're breaking it down for your understanding. So now that I, since I've told you what it is not, I want to talk a little bit about what do you want to accomplish when you do prototypes? What are you after? You know, because that's also a tough one. I still struggle with this when I'm saying let's prototype it, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what am I prototyping? Why am I doing this? Why am I writing dirty code? You know, what is the testing? What is the assumption? So this is an important part we really need to think about if you want the results from prototypes. Right? Firstly, you have to be able to decompose your game, break it up into all its various pieces. The audio, the animation, the UI, the look and feel, the mechanics, you know, the platform, the rendering, it could be any kind of stuff, the frame rate, right? Just break it up. Because you don't want to have it come together and then you need to understand what you're trying to solve. You think, oh, the game doesn't feel right. Well, is it the animation? Or is it the control scheme? What's got the problem, right? You really need to think hard on it. So it's important in order to accomplish, uh, you know, in order to make a good prototype that answers a question, you need to be able to decompose your game right here. You also have to, before you begin, I think this is important from an artistic point, is you need to have a look and feel, an artistic and emotional target. What is this game going to feel like? Because not everything is defined. So. The point here is you want to gather reference material, other games, uh, media, movies, all kinds of stuff, uh, feeling, feelings like uh, what we call emotional targets around what this game has to be. Because until you have that target and you're prototyping, see it's all undefined, right? You're in this fluid state. So you need something to guide you and this is very helpful before you start to prototype. Because if you start just jumping into the code of the art, like what your art style should be. You won't even be able to answer that. You just keep iterating indefinitely. So, yeah. Yes. So, see that that's demographics, right? Once you do a demographic research, you need to come down to the game you're building, right? Ultimately, so I'm coming down to black level. So demographics is a little further back. It's more market and business and overall planning and scope and concept, right? You've gone further than that. So now that you've identified your personas, your age groups, you know your skill level, you know your mechanics, right? That's when you're coming into prototyping, right? Because already, if you know it's an eight-year-old, it's a game for an eight-year-old. You already know it's not going to be completely, you know, high skill. It's going to be low skill. It has to have high reward. Right? These are the basics. So now you're saying, I have a low skill activity, it's just, you know, swiping the screen or, you know, shaking the phone and they're tossing stuff up. It could be, any, and now you're saying, what am I protecting? So it is, you're already done with that part at this level. So, also what you want to accomplish is that understand what parts you know and if you know them, just be honest and if you don't know them, be honest and protect the parts you need to know, get information from whether it's mock-ups or animations or just the mechanics you need to test. If you already have another game that you know, you, you are adapting from or taking borrowing ideas from, don't make the prototype if you're pretty sure that you're going to take that mechanic and put it in here. So you need to understand how you're going to break up your idea and quickly test it. You can, and use whatever approach you have to do it. So, this is uh, the critical part, the critical thinking part. Whenever you have a prototype, uh, you have to set up what is called a falsifiable experiment. That means the question has to be so specific right, that either it's a yes or a no, ideally, or it reveals something to you. Right? So I say, I'm making, a, I'm going to test a prototype of shaking the phone for my game and I'm going to see if it's fun. Right? But that's still too vague, right? Maybe what you need to say is, I'm so maybe trying to throw a ball into a little slot on my mobile phone by shaking the phone. Right. So the falsifiable, falsifiable experiment could be, is a 10 year old child able to grab the phone, start the game, and then within about 10 seconds or 4 seconds, you know, tilt the phone and drive the ball into the slot. You know, that's simple. And then you pass the prototype around to 10 kids, and then either they're complaining and saying you can never get it in, which you know very quickly, or they're thinking this is boring because it's too simple. So now I have an experiment. So don't try to prototype the whole game or do concepts, right? So that's the key. Can you falsify? Critical test. 
And of course, you would want to be able to fail early and achieve merit. It's taking two months to set up this experiment, line up people, talk to them, set up, right, make forms and docs. That's then you're not accomplishing. Now, when you do all this stuff and you have all this throwaway code and throwaway art and all that, what it ends up giving you is clarity and a direction. Um, I can't over, ever overstate or to emphasize that how hard or intangible it is to get the team on board and in the same direction. You give them the docs, you keep talking to them, they still miss the point. And sometimes prototypes help you. They give you the clarity that what we are building and what we are not building. And so that's what it's useful for. So if you are able to prototype successfully, the team gets a direction. You know, this of course it's complemented with the docs and how you communicate with them, but it definitely helps. Because all the failures teach, you know, they show the team. They all start asking questions like, why are we doing this way? What's this prototype for? You know, I thought we already knew the animation. Why, what is this animation test they are running? Why are we having so many mock-ups of the backgrounds? I thought it was decided it's green, right? So, but it, when they participate in this entire exercise, they understand, oh wait, there are some assumptions I'm making and there are some assumptions someone else is making. And we're beating up those assumptions with these prototypes. So, that's what you would want to accomplish. And I'm done with questions now. So, I, what I'll post, I'll post two or three articles which I got this off of and see my own uh, experiences with prototyping and they were pretty bad when I started out. I all, read up all these articles and I fell in back in the ditch uh, despite knowing all this theoretically. So if you talk to developers, game developers who are independent or are creative, they have a graveyard of projects, hundreds of failed projects, bad ideas which they have. It's the rule, it's not uncommon. No one is tidy. If he's tidy, he's lying or he's not creative. So uh, that's what is interesting to talk about, but you know, we don't have time about it. So I thought I'd take questions from you, maybe even share some stuff from you. Or we can review any of the slides at the back. Talked about creativity, how open are all many creativity is to See, it depends on the experiment, right? I mean, if you're looking at uh, like something more specific like animation, you need a skilled person who is from the field of animation and art in order to judge, like, are you missing keyframes or frame rate, right? You don't need more than two people. It's because it's expert-based. If I were to do something like a more consumer-based test, like, you know, having a kid throw the ball, it's got to be a critical audience. That means five or six kids, you know, that's good enough. Uh, I don't think this is an exhaustive market survey. It's not. So it's a small set. <coughs> Can you talk about maybe some of the prototypes that you did and where you started from, where you ended up with, were there a lot of variations in the middle? Yeah, I was, um, uh, there's one thing I did, I, I used Cocos on Python, I think very few people know about it, but Cocos 2D actually started on Python, and uh, this is a game I was writing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, and I had this cool idea that, you know, we should not have keyboard controllers and D-pads and all, everything should be like, gestures and movements and really so smooth and artistic and fluid and put this together in, in Cocos Python where I, what I did was, I, I, I was a programmer, I was not an artist, I didn't want to waste time with anything so I looked up the internet and you get a lot of sprite sheets for Nintendo games online, you can download them so and there's sometimes these zip files and it's got like five, six hundred characters so searched on the net, found it then I didn't want to even animate, so then I stole sprite sheets for those. And these are off of commercial Nintendo games. Use that. Then I use Cocos, and if you haven't tried out Cocos, I would recommend you try it. It's on Python. Python is very dynamically typed, very quick. Uh, Cocos has a really nice model of putting together scenes. Uh, so I did that, and this was like a side scroller I was doing. And then I wrote the code for just the gesture. So I was able to put a scene together, uh, copy some character from a sprite sheet that I stole off the internet and then I just got writing the code uh, for the gesture. What I was trying to do is uh, I, I was going to do it all through the mouse. That means if I want to attack someone, I would slice slice them on screen and if I wanted to do a shield, I would just draw a circle. Now what happened is I thought, okay, that's that's good enough. But the mistake I made was I was assembling the background, the character and I thought until they you know, reacted and I had all the effects, I would be fine. But, you know, I wasted time in that. Eventually I found out that 
drawing semicircles on the screen is too tedious for people. It, I, I needed just two other people to test this and myself and I started to repeat. And this was way back, this was like four or five years ago. And I realized that just doing something repetitively is tiring. There's a good reason why people have very simple control schemes. So that's what I learned. Although I learned it very slowly, very in a hard way. That's something I did. Um, uh, there was another time, um, I think there are my friends who were doing projects. There are a lot of these other screw-ups. They were trying to make prototypes or small versions of the game. And uh, they chose the wrong tool. Like it didn't have the ability to code. Um, there was other stuff where I tried to integrate animation with the code and waste time on that. So th it's more of mistakes, but I think it'll need much more time because I'll need to actually show you, have you see the code and see how I screwed up, you know. What this is really about is me, I should show you, to show you the code. Right? This is what I thought, this is what I did, and this is where I screwed up. Because I think that's very important to think about where you miss the mark, right? Not just, so, then I realized it's just coming down to how narrow you can get. Then I learned from that and my subsequent thing I was doing, I wanted to have a throw like a force blow with uh, like a power, um, uh, like a fireball, you know, energy fireball. So, so I wanted to do that. Then I realized I'm, I wouldn't do any of the animation or the background. I just took box 2D, you know, just the pure box 2D uh, engine and used like lines and um, you know, square boxes and did the whole thing. I was able to test it out. So then I learned from that and got more successful. It also depends on how qualified your team are. There are people, I work with game teams in the US where it's 50 people a team, they're all veterans and super skilled, you know, and they prototype in Unity, full full 3D prototypes in one week. And they're, they're fine because they have the capability to do that. They have everything lined up. That depends where you are. So, if there's any other thing people want to share, you know, we can talk about also questions or their experiences with prototyping, what they thought of, uh, anyone has ideas of how they could set up criteria to prototype. What was the ideal length for a game concept prototype, as you say? Just get the art from the internet and just make something. Like well, I didn't even need to make the art if I understood uh, what I was trying to do, but I did. So, I like I said, like Boris Steel, I think if you are like a really small team, you should take, you should be able to take a week. And if you're taking more than a week, there's two things that are either happening. You, you're you trying to solve too big a problem or you don't know your tools good enough. Okay, And you have to solve both. You need to so decompose your problem, like I said. And sometimes, the confusing part is you don't know your tools and programming or your your craft well enough, and that takes time, which is okay. Right? But then recognize that, like, oh, I don't know how to animate really quickly or, you know, do keyframes or motion path animation. Fine, you know, then that doesn't count because then you need that time to learn that skill. So that's where it gets really dodgy. This is another thing that really got me because I got so frustrated with the prototype, you know, when I was doing it back in the day, was like, why can't I do it? And there was some knowledge I didn't have of game programming or animation. And it gets mixed in and you get confused and you think the prototype's taking too long. So be aware of that, you know. But a week is good, I think, a week is good. If you can do it in a week, uh, you want to have a very rapid state of mind. Like, uh, there's got to be a sort of impatience and a intolerance uh, towards quality or towards thing. So because you want to say, okay, in three days it should be done. Come on, come on, come on. Why is it taking more than three days? Keep banging at it. So. Uh, can I continue prototyping while developing the game? Uh, the game has started developing like, uh, or, or should I put uh, this way? How big a prototyping should be? I have a good idea, I'm prototyping it, and I uh, throw out a feature, I add it, prototype, then again a feature, again a feature. Where should I stop prototyping and start game developing? And while developing, I thought of some feature, and I'm saying, oh, I'm doubtful about this one, so should I add to prototype or game developer? So, you can prototype, like I said, mostly during pre-production, doesn't mean later. You can always do later, and at any point. Uh, there's a famous thing, people say, ask for forgiveness, not permission. So uh, my advice is that if you're on a team and no one's going to, till you sell the idea and try to screw that, go home, work on it alone, 
you know, don't tell anyone, just make the damn thing. Make it rough, cheap, quick. Bring it, just show it. Be done in two days, right? That's the approach. The second is you can add to it, but like I said, if it's solving many problems, you're throwing in complexity, and then the whole thing is getting more complicated, unless you have the whole thing very tightly defined. <coughs> so don't try to add to prototypes. Also, you have to understand, prototyping is a part or a, a means. Right? It is not game production per se. So if you do it in pre-production, you can do it later also. But it doesn't mean that you add to the code. I wouldn't take a prototype and add the code to that. Right? I would almost say that if you quickly prototype something and it was fantastic, it worked perfectly, you have the code, I would say delete the code and rewrite the code in the production environment in that check it in, do the build, do it deliberately separate. Don't integrate, don't reuse, because it's got a lot of other risks with that. How are we doing on time? Out? Okay. So, I will post this up on the, on my website, down there, and I will post the links to three or four great, really cool articles on prototyping. Um, that will be a homework because I've drawn from those articles so you all have that all that material to uh, to read. Uh, this is on the internet but have a look. Thank you. Everybody awake? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll not waste too much time. I'll let Amog and Vijay come in and uh, give their presentation. So I think everybody's hungry also. Very well. I think that was a Excellent presentation, by Ruth. I mean, uh, where we are talking about today from SK's perspective, it's on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, just uh, wanted to quickly check uh, within this audience, how many of you are actually developers or pursuing careers to be a developer? Almost all of them now. <laughs> uh, so I think this, the presentation and what we do at SQS is on the other side of it. And, and what I see here in the audience is, almost similar to what uh, I saw when I started my career in the IT industry. Everybody wanted to be a developer. Uh, nobody wanted to do testing. Uh, eventually things did change and I'm hoping that uh, in the games industry as well, you know, although it's a recognized thing, it does become a career opportunity for people who aspire to be in the industry and move forward. So in today's session, I'm going to touch upon what, what uh, we at SQS do and how we see industry from the other end of the spectrum, which is doing quality assurance and testing, how we work with uh, large organizations, uh, global publishers, uh, studios, uh, either locally or uh, across the globe, and help them produce quality games. Because at the end of the day, uh, we all remember the good games that we play, but there are a lot of other games which are not up to our mark expectations which you kind of look at, play, and then let go. Uh, there's a lot at stake for publishers and game developers when they put in the, uh, these games. There's a lot of time and energy, and more importantly, uh, money that they spend on. And uh, where we come in uh, as, as SQS to help uh, developers and publishers uh, realize their dreams. Okay, the success that we call is the success that we get from our developers in terms of their uh, games becoming popular. Uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 years, we've worked with a lot of uh, large titles. We've, we've worked with multiple publishers across the world. And we've kind of formed up a, a process by which we, we believe we can bring a change in the games industry in terms of putting in quality content out. Great. Uh, I've also got uh, my colleague Vijay here uh, today who heads our games testing practice. And to keep things very simple, I'll make the pitch here. And if there are any questions, he's going to answer those. I'll talk a little bit about SQS uh, as a company, how we started off doing uh, games testing, what was our idea about getting into games testing, what exactly do we mean and do in games testing, what are the opportunities that lie for uh, people who aspire to be in the gaming industry. Uh, there are challenges obviously in every field, uh, be it development, publishing, uh, or, or any other activity that you do. And of course there are career opportunities uh, that, that we can all look after you know, in, in testing itself. Very briefly, SQS is the largest independent testing and quality assurance consultancy worldwide. We've been doing quality assurance and testing for the last 30 years. Uh, we, we are a German company, as, as 
you all might be aware, you know, being German company, it's, it's all about automobile, finance, uh, manufacturing industry, things like that. However, uh, we have an India operations where we focus on uh, media, entertainment, and more in, importantly, games testing as a uh, dedicated practice. Uh, as an organization, we are 2,000 odd people, uh, all testing experts, people who make their careers in QA and testing. Some of our clients in, in the gaming gambling space, Warner Brothers, THQ used to be our customer, Pocket Gems, Peak Games, so just, just a few uh, to name. As you can see, these are large publishers in consoles, mobiles, social media games, things like that. Apart from this space, we also work uh, primarily with organizations in Europe who are developing games for the gambling industry, so the games which are slots, dice, roulettes, and things like that. Uh, and, and that's exactly where we started our games testing practice. So, uh, as, as I told you earlier, it's a 30-year-old company. Games testing, perhaps, was not something that was on our horizon. But in early 2000, we did see that there is an opportunity. This is a uh, industry which is growing, uh, primarily uh, in terms of you know, its, its users, uh, the money that's getting pumped into it, and things like that. Uh, and we thought you know, it might be a good idea for us to you know, start doing something in, in this space itself. What we as an organization had was a very well developed methodology in which we could we knew that we could bring a lot of rigor to the industry in terms of you know ad adding quality initiatives to it. Okay, uh, I, I was the one who, who started off you know taking up this initiative along with Vijay. To to me you know it was fine. Okay, you know let's play games. You know we've tried and tested enterprise applications. Uh, sometimes it can get monotonous and boring. You know let's see how it goes. Uh, as we started uh, going through our journey, we realized it's not that easy. You know, uh, my experience across the last 15-20 uh, years has been it is one of the toughest jobs to do if you are getting into games testing itself. Okay, it is you got to differentiate yourself from playing games and testing games. You got to look at, look at various aspects within the game in terms of you know how you make sure that the game does what it is intended to do. Uh, uh, and, and then so on and so forth. I've got a few slides later on where we'll talk a little bit about it. But uh, what we also realized at that point of time when we started that the console industry was pretty big. You know, people wanted to build up a lot of games on consoles. Uh, it's a pretty hard thing to get into that industry if you are an independent test house. Uh, so uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, barrier that we had to climb was to you know get ourselves associated and registered with all the manufacturers it's become a lot easier when you talk about mobile games and you know mobile hardware which is essentially you know the retail hardware that you use to test and things like that but as an organization we, we got ourselves registered with sony microsoft nintendo perhaps one of the first test houses from from india who, who had all these uh, partnerships there uh, over the last two years, we've also seen a lot of work that we the government do on the mobile platforms, and that's where our associations with uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and, and, a, and a lot of work that we do on R&D with, with the Android platform itself. Just, just a glimpse of some of the games that uh, we've tested so far. Uh, the idea is to let you know that as games testers, there is a lot of opportunity for you to look at games of various genres on various platforms. Uh, some of them, you know, Batman, Wheelman, uh, All Stars, have been tested on Sony and Microsoft platforms. The three at the bottom of the slide, like the Tab Zoo, are all which we have tested on the mobile platforms like the iPhones and the Androids. Uh, there, there's Assassin's Creed, which we tested early last year, which is again on the mobile platform. So from games testing perspective, there is an opportunity for people to, to look at various types of games, various genres, know about uh, different games, not just the ones that you're testing, but compare the games that you're testing along with some things that are similar, as well as uh, work on varied platforms, cutting edge technology, which is what uh, you, know, you get to do as, as a game tester itself. Two of the most successful titles that we've tested is the Batman Arkham City and, and Vijay here was the head uh, lead uh, tester here from our side and uh, the, the, the game in itself and as I said you know, we've helped people make successful games because the game itself got a lot of success. It was rated the best game of the year in 2012 
and it has got a lot of awards in the industry itself. SQS in itself had a 60 people team working on this game, testing on both uh, Microsoft as well as Sony platform. Uh, so from testing perspective, you know, it's a good achievement. You know, people make big games, people are associated of, by developing games and they proudly talk about doing this. Uh, but when you're a tester, there's not much you can talk about in terms of this, but these are achievements that you know people from our company can go back and you know talk to our customers and, and people who aspire to do that. You know, uh, I've got a video here which actually is uh, something which I never thought uh, I'd get into. This is this is just a demo of the Arkham City. But what's important to me and my team is uh, to get our name in the credits. Uh, Point here is that very rarely do games testers get recognized. Uh, but uh, when you get involved in large projects, when you work very well, and, and when you have partnership with your publishers, they do make it a point that you know you get in there. I've worked in the industry where I've worked outside of the games vertical itself. You know, you, you've been involved in large projects uh, which are you know worth millions of dollars and things like that. Testers, they don't get recognized. You know, there's always a big news about which organization does a project. You know how successfully they've implemented. What are the benefits each uh, each organization has achieved out of it? But I think in this field itself, there is a recognition that an individual gets, which is which is quite important because we all want to get recognized. As a testing organization, we are always on the background. You know, we, we are not the ones who are very glamorous in, in itself. Where you know we have got very catchy content and things like that. You know, uh, I mean while I was putting up this presentation you know I, and if you look at any other presentations with SQS you'll find that everything is very box you know where it is very German you know where, where everything is very systematically put up in tables and bullets and things like that uh, this is the most creative we can get but when we do games testing there's a lot of other creative work that we can do we also firmly believe that you know the the, the uh, some of our best testers uh, that we have got in our organization have actually entered into our organization as games testers, where they have been able to you know look at things from various different aspects and build up their careers, be it in games testing itself or in, in any other world outside the games vertical itself. This is just a glimpse of what what a typical tester is is subjected to when they get get into uh, the gaming industry. Uh, for us. What, what we provide is uh, the whole circle of testing services like you know the entire gameplay, multiplayer testing, functionality testing where you test the game through and through end to end in terms of making sure all the characters, objectives are working as per what the, the game is defined to work. Uh, there are a lot of tests around compatibility in the game space especially with the mobile and, and the PCs which is a big challenge for people. Uh, when, when you go and play online games and play games which are uh, multiplayer online, there are issues around performance which is a lot of technical testing that can be done and things like that. Uh, some of the typical testing uh, that, that people do uh, in, in our organization is the playthrough testing, the upgrades on the mobiles which is quite frequently required, compliance for uh, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo as well as Apple platform to maintain the quality and the uh, standards that these manufacturers uh, define is a very specialized area. And, and that requires you not only to understand the, the games, but, but the way they are working against the guidelines that are put up by these manufacturers. Uh, there are technical tests which we do along with our networking people, which is to test the games on 
different bandwidth, simulating LAN, mm -hmm. WAN, 3G, Wi-Fi connectivity, making sure that the players drop in, drop out, that some game states are maintained and things like that. So, you know, all this is kind of, you know, very challenging to people. Uh, looks simple, sounds very simple, but when you actually get into real life scenario, it, it takes you a lot of planning and designing tests before you actually go in and, and do that. Uh, one of the things that we learned with our experience is when we started taking people on board, People were just excited to say, okay, I can play games and I can earn money. Uh, eventually, it, it doesn't really turn out to be like that. You know, while, while you're doing testing, your job is to make sure that you're reporting the right things, uh, or rather, you're reporting things that are not right in the game. Uh, I perhaps stepped out of doing the games testing because I wasn't really good at it, and I think Vijay kind of, you know, succeeded me because he was quite good, because he, he, he had a keen eye and looking at where the game goes wrong rather than trying to beat the game and say, okay, now I've, 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 I've done what the game is actually intending me to do. Uh, for a tester, uh, the mentality is not to do what the game intends to do, but try and break the game by trying and doing things which the game doesn't allow you to do. That's, that's a very key differentiator in, in, in doing a game development as well as games testing itself. Okay? And, and that's where we see a lot of uh, challenges. As an organization, I talked about us doing a lot of other things, but what we also realized that uh, for us to have a very successful games testing organization, we needed to change the outlook in which we approach this. Uh, it doesn't really need you to be just a good games tester, but it also needs you to be a good person with uh, a keen eye for details. You have to have uh, a, a lot of focus on how you communicate things, how clear are you in your understanding of a particular game, its objective, what it needs to do, what audience it is intended for, and then accordingly start playing the game. Uh, from from uh, With an organization which does a lot of work in the enterprise world, we also realized that we were looking out for people who were very different. We, we weren't able to get people who are engineers and good at you know coding or writing uh, tests to play games because gameplay also needs specific skills. You know, you might be good at you know reporting stuff that you 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 find out and you pick up, but if you cannot progress to certain levels and cannot achieve uh, you know the objectives that the game set up, you know never going to go to the end of the game. Uh, which means, you know, as a tester, you're not good, doing a good job. We actually then went to the market and tried to find out people who were interested in good, making career in games testing, people who were uh, playing games and and were good at understanding, you know, how games work. You know, it's not just about trying to beat the game, but you know, playing games, trying to you know work out you know which game within a genre is good and why you like it, why you don't like it, and things like that. Uh, when we we also have. Uh, you know, the assessments that we do to our people which are not just, you know, asking people about what games you play and, you know, how, how much do you play and what do you know about the game. We actually do their hands-on in terms of, you know, making them play on the mobile devices, games which have got defects in it, trying to figure out whether they are able to uh, figure out those defects put them down and explain them properly because that's the job of a tester, so to say, you know. A tester actually is helping, you know, from my perspective, helping the developer to make a game better or to make sure that the game, when it is uh, released to the market, doesn't uh, crash or doesn't hang somewhere on you because, you know, you're likely not to get back to the game again, you know, so that's that's the way our job is defined right now. Uh, from, from a career perspective, what we've done with people who join us uh, in, in this practice is there are specific trainings around testing that we do. So people who come in from a gaming background are trained on doing testing, uh, taught about testing concepts, have been given uh, certifications which are industry recognized, which help them build up uh, you know, a, a formal testing approach as they uh, work through it. Uh, from from a customer point of view, we do have mechanisms where we, we've helped them build up uh, Checklist games testing is very difficult in terms of where you build up coverage, matrix, and things like that. Uh, there are other things that we do in games testing, which is where you know you need a lot of visual evidence in terms of how you report your defects, because sometimes it's about the time at which you know you, you do a particular action. Sometimes it's just one particular passing screen where you do that. It's very difficult to document and do things. You know, so those are the things that we have adapted in our organization in terms of helping testers, also train them how to use these tools and techniques, and and make sure that you know they they are doing their job correctly. Games testing itself poses a big challenge in terms of organizations giving their IP across to, to 
uh, companies like SQS, you know, for which we need to have very secured labs, and that's something that we have put up uh, in our organization. We believe our customers uh, are very protective about their IP, and they need to make sure and be comfortable about their code getting across to our organization, which is outside of the building, and still not going out to the market because that's going to defeat the purpose of uh, their building up that particular game ahead of the competition. The tester's job is not easy. I mean, uh, as I said earlier, you know, it was great fun for us to say, okay, let's play games and let's earn some money, you know. Uh, but great. Uh, what we've also seen in the last two, three years is the games industry has evolved. You know, earlier the games that we used to test used to be just one-off product. We would test the game for three to six months depending on its size and complexity. The game goes out for certification, it's certified and that's the end of it. In the last two years, we've seen a lot of digitization of content, which does mean that you know the, the you you can add levels, you can add characters, you can purchase in, in the game itself. You know, so testing a game one off is not the end of it. But when you go on to downloadable content and things like that, we are actually uh, not just trying to test the new characters that has been added to the game, but also trying to test the entire game to say that this addition to the character or a module is not breaking any other part of the game itself. What we've also seen is there are a lot of time constraints in terms of you know when the game is released and when you start putting in all these uh, downloadable content out, uh, you want to make sure that you know there is a quick fix to it. You know the, the you know publishers want to get those out because that is another revenue earning model for them, and you want to make sure that it, it's not hampering the gameplay impact by by adding a module or you know characters to the game. Uh, compatibility when you talk about mobile platform tablet PCs is becoming a bigger challenge day by day. Uh, while Apple is still good at it because they've got six or seven of their devices, Android seems to be coming out with newer and newer devices. Uh, that, that in itself poses a challenge. You need to have an understanding about an OS, the hardware, the capabilities of the hardware, uh, and plus you know what the game is able to do with that particular hardware. So now that is important from a tester's perspective. Uh, when, when a game comes to test, you need to make sure that it is tested on the most optimum hardware or, or you know, the, the uh, subset of uh, OSs and the uh, devices that is available. You know, you cannot have all the permutation combinations. You know, that is something that a tester has to take a call on. Uh, games are now integrated to the social networking sites as well. So you know, you have a lot of different integrations that take place, which goes, which takes the games tester's job beyond just this beating the game itself. You know, you you need to understand the ecosystem around the game. There are now subscription-based games where you are actually physically paying it through some payment method or cards and things like that. So you know you need to understand how that particular thing works. You know, what are you allowed to buy, how much you're allowed to buy. There are rules which are country specific, region specific, uh, you know, things like that. So you know that's kind of adding a lot of challenges to the games testing world itself. In in some cases we've also seen that you know people want to have games which are primarily developed on a console which you can then take forward in the same state that you left on a console to a mobile device. So just to have a maintain so just to maintain the continuity of the game moving forward. That poses a lot of challenges which we hadn't seen, so on and so forth. So in general I think you know it's it's not that you know you come in, you play the game, you you, you see some errors. You also now are su starting to look at various other aspects outside of the game when you look at games testing as, as an opportunity or challenge itself uh, in, in general. Uh, for, for people who, who do aspire to come into the games testing world, there are opportunities. Uh, our experiences with some of our customers and even working within SQS, we've seen that there are opportunities. On the left, I've, I've got an uh, image which talks about you know, how a games, game tester can grow if he wants to stick to a testing line itself, you know, so from a tester to a lead tester to a supervisor to a manager and, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, in our organization, we have examples of people who have come up to the ranks, you know, and, and reached to the level of where they are now QA supervisors, independently managing uh, a relationship with some of the large publishers, opportunity to work on the games that I, I talked about, you know, so it's, it's not just about testing the same game on the same platform, but games testing in itself provides you a, a, a large variety of things that you can look up to. You know, it, uh, as you go up the ranks and uh, as you go up, you know, in terms of managing teams and, and, you know, handling customer relationship, it also gives you a career opportunity to, to, to kind of, you know, be, be a manager, you know, to look at uh, organize, 
gives you an organizational responsibility. So it is a very well-defined career growth path. I do see this picking up in the Indian industry very much. Uh, there are a lot of uh, publishers who are now looking to establish their uh, operations in India. Some of them have had successful operations in India. And as this trend grows, I'm sure you will see game <coughs> testers uh, being part of our culture itself as much as you know the, the testing, you know, the enterprise testing uh, is now become a career opportunity. But, uh, testing gives you an opportunity to understand the concept, to look at games in, in different ways. There are different games that you look at it. You, you are allowed to make suggestions, uh, talk to your publishers and developers to say, you know, what in a game is something that you not liked, not liked. And, you know, from that experience, you can then go to the other areas within the gaming uh, industry itself, in, in the development world, which could be a good opportunity for people to make career itself. Uh, in our organization, we have seen people take both streams and move up the ladder. And I firmly believe that these, this stands an opportunity for people who want to make a career in the games industry and use it as a stepping stone itself. If you have any questions on this. I know it's a very different topic than what you guys are taught about and looked on, but uh, if you have questions, I wouldn't be surprised even if they are you know, simple questions in terms of how you get into it and what do you do to become a games tester. Start. Were you uh, able to find all the Riddler trophies in Arkham City while testing? The what? three guys in the corner, they, these are the guys who tested it, and that's the reason we've got them here. I was not able to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can you tell us more about the Arkham City experience? Actually? Do you want to come in and uh, say something yeah. about it? Yeah. So, sorry, uh, obviously, I'm sorry. Experience as in uh, the testing experience, or uh, yeah. you want the uh, how it all started and. I mean, we, we've been working with Warner Brothers for a long time now, okay, so uh, uh, we've tested uh, some of their titles like uh, uh, perhaps at Scooby-Doo, Green Lantern, uh, there are a few others uh, that we tested. So we, we are one of the strategic testing partners in terms of, you know, when they look at, you know, getting work outside of their premises. Uh, they, the, the primary reason why they kind of, you know, started talking to us was that uh, they knew that the game was big, they knew that the game had a... Uh, a, a concept that could make it successful, but they also wanted to make sure that uh, the game is of the quality that uh, you would expect uh, someone like Warner Brothers to put out. Uh, one of the primary reasons why they got SQS involved was uh, they wanted to make sure that they there are no crashes and there are no game the showstoppers in, in the game. And they wanted us to kind of, you know, make, uh, fit, you know, identify and, and uh, report them at a very early stage. Okay. So as, a, as an organization, where we come into picture is when, when our, our partners or our uh, customers have a problem with the quality. Okay. Uh, or or they see that you know we, we need some more hands and eyes to make sure that you know we are covered up from all fronts. And that's how the whole uh, thing started. From my experience perspective, I think I can I can definitely tell on behalf of the team. You know, all of us were quite excited, okay, uh, just because Batman's a character that we've all been associated right from our childhood, and it was great fun. Uh, a lot of them actually, uh, we didn't have fist fights, but there were a lot of you know. Uh, competition in terms of who wanted to be on the game and test uh, like that. But it also worked very well uh, for us because, you know, because of the enthusiasm that the testing team had, we were able to put in a lot more time and energies and make sure that, you know, the stakes being high, we, we, were, we didn't want to let our partners down. And, and that kind of works very well, you know, and then you see that, you know, the game gets that bigger recognition. You know, it, it's a proud moment for us, you know, and, and it's a moment which we actually want to come in and share with a lot of our, uh, you know, customers and, and people in the industry itself. And uh, even if the, all of this sounds very uh, very fun and goody. It was, it was one moment when um, the SQS office was almost open for 24 by 7. Um, it was a hectic schedule for everyone, starting from the leads to the testers, to the managers, for me. It was, it was a, it was a time when uh, our lives were filled. Batman and nothing else. <laughs> so, uh, 
the publishers were expect as Amol said, you know, the publishers were expecting um, crashes to be reported in the very early stages. And then we can go ahead and look further for other functional defects. That is what they said. Um, normally, it's it's very easy that you know you you are testing a game and you come across defects and then you keep reporting them. But the only things that you you were expected or we were expected to report was crashes. So it was even a difficult job to keep the testers back by saying. अरे वो रिपोर्ट मत करें यार तू वो सब छोड़ पहले क्रैशेस दी सो दैट वाज आल्सो अ चैलेंज ऑफ दे सो दैट दैट इज अगेन अ थिंग एंड फॉर द ट्रॉफीज वन ऑफ द द चेकलिस दैट वी हैड वाज अबाउट द ट्रॉफीज सो इज एवरी ट्रॉफी अचीवेबल सो दैट इज द टेस्ट दैट वी वर एक्सपेक्टेड नो इट्स नॉट सो वी हैड टू डू इट विथ � Every build that uh, I'm with those doing that. It's a puzzle, right? so once you know that, so you can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how much time it took for the complete testing? Though it is a very huge game. It, 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 I think it took. I mean, we were involved in it for about seven months or so. Yeah, uh, we it went for about. 13 months in all, uh, including the DLCs. I mean, the, the original release, I think we were involved for about 7 yeah. months. Including the DLCs, it was about 13 yeah. months. 3 or 4 DLCs that they came on. How many people? 60. Uh, but that split up between uh, PS3 and Xbox at that point. I mean, Warner had their own team of about 45 odd people, uh, a few at the developers and a few at their uh, publishing studios. Uh, but overall, I think they had a hundred people team testing the whole game. Given you are an external uh, your organization and you talked about testing, and again, there are a lot of students and your original, uh, is the idea I get is that you tell people about testing as a career. Could you also tell them a bit about dev ways where they are actually embedded into the team and they are more of creative input? Uh, yeah, I mean, and I would have, I would perhaps have a very limited uh, uh, input in, in that side of it and I perhaps might have talked about dev and uh, publisher QA uh, at the front itself. But I think uh, in, in addition to this, uh, Tejas, right? Yeah. yeah, so what Tejas is getting into is that, you know, publishers uh, or, or the developers actually have their own internal QA teams, which is also called dev QA. And, and the reason they have this is because they need a tester closer to them who, who is able to test the game at a unit level as soon as a module or a character is created, give them an instant P feedback, uh, make sure that you know uh, that you know the game is in doing what it is intended to do and things like that. That is essentially the first check in which you know when, when you know you're looking at developing a game that you know that it is going the right way. Then comes a stage where you know all the modules or characters are integrated into it and then it starts taking taking shape to a point where a game goes into an alpha state. And that is exactly where an external company like SQS kind of comes into play where we are more looking at a game from an end to end perspective. Uh, whereas the opportunities that you would have with the likes of EA or you know others is where you could do dev queue as well. Uh, further, if you are technical and and if you want to get into technical uh, testing as well, dev queue I believe can also get associated by writing some of your own code by which you can make sure that the character and all its attributes are working very well. It's not about just manually going and doing things as well. So you know there are a lot of those kind of opportunities as well that you can pursue. I've got it right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, uh, as an organization, we're trying to get there as well. I mean, but the challenge there is you've got to be a lot closer to the customers in terms of you know, how you work and things like that. Uh, uh, I mean, we've got perhaps not to talk that often, but you know, the skills actually, you know, from a depth queue perspective, are there in terms of you know, the scripting and things like that. But it's you, you just need people who, who understand the game since the time it's been conceptualized and things like that to, to kind of do depth queue with some people. Few things. I mean, at the end of the day, there, there is a thin line in terms of you know where we get into the game's uh, content 
and and where we talk about you know suggesting how the game should be okay uh, of course as as on how you know you get in more and more experienced testers you know they they can and and if they are working with the development team uh, continuously the tester can go and talk about you know what he feels the game should be or what he feels a particular you know a, a slide or screen should look like and things like that uh, at the end of the day it's it's a completely different team that that is working on terms of you know putting in the uh, content on the particular screen okay we can and and from from our perspective we generally do put up a lot of suggestions uh but it is at the end of the day for for the uh, publisher and the business side of the publisher to decide uh, what level of change they want to do and and if that change is to be done what is the impact it's going to have on the overall you know uh, game itself so i mean there's a very thin line there you know you you can as a tester you would want to because you know you've looked at some games which are similar to it and you want to bring in your experience there but you don't really want to push it too much because you know that's where you're not doing a tester job you're then getting on to the other side of the spectrum one more thing to add to it as you can see this um some of the games like uh, it's it's always a case that not the same age group for whom the game is meant is testing the game uh games like scribble not or maybe even tapsu uh there are more of them as well these were uh, released on ds and these were meant for kids okay, but the testers were uh, already college grads so we we were even giving in um comments like the game is too difficult okay, so you have to get your brains down to a 6 year kid a 6 year old kid 10 year old kid and then say things like okay, it's too difficult for that person now just make it a bit simpler okay these kind of suggestions go away now your uh, question was about the front end that would also be the same way I mean, this is not a front end that would be expected. So those comments go. Those comments definitely. So I have a question uh, regarding the new mobile games like Tap Zoo, Paradise Zoo. These are basically premium games as yes. far as what the mobile industry is changing towards. Where does SQS come into the play? Where the economy design and things like that are need to be tested for in-app purchases. Right. Okay. So the in-app purchases is the premium economy. How do you guys help? in terms of designing those as a as a testing organization so if if you are like playing premium games you need to set a usability pattern you have certain the funnels that you need to design around it how do you guys help as a testing organization i'm glad i've got pankaj here who can answer <laughs> uh, okay i'm uh, pankaj yadav and uh, working with testers and leading the mobile testing games uh like uh, you said that uh, these are the premium games and uh, in app purchase is very important in these yeah. games so uh, we, uh, normally what we uh, do is we discuss this with publishers and uh, we design a pattern where we can uh, we can have a test cards and uh, we can have a set up set a pattern where we can in app purchase and we can go through that pattern and then uh, we can decide that okay uh, we we are able to uh, the purchases and uh, all the uh, securities and uh, credit card uh, securities are in place for that basically it's about the economy the so, game so economy. you're asking about balancing yeah. so yeah balance the word is balance yeah. so does sqs help in balancing the economy or or do you guys deal with the functional test itself uh, no we deal with the functional test okay thanks thanks so yeah. Uh, were these uh, automated testing involved, or was it manual with such a large team? Or how do you balance out yeah. where to go automate it's, manual? What are the tools that were used for automation, if any? It is manual to, to a large extent, and uh, it's just the nature of uh, games where you can't really. Uh, I mean, there are infinite scenarios, and it, it differs from player to player in terms of you know what their reaction times are, at what point they want to do what, and and it's it's your brain actually trying to run the game the way you want to you know go and uh, achieve achieve you know go go through the. I mean, even on a simple game, you know you still have five six different ways in in which you go to the end of the game. You know what achievements that you want to you know objectives you want to pick up and things like that. It's very difficult to automate. at the end of the day you know there, there's also a trade off that the industry would do in terms of automation is a lot of upfront investment it's not that easy to kind of automate uh, in, on on the games testing it is 
very human interactions. So you know you cannot simulate those kind of situations. It's very easier in the enterprise world where, where there are set patterns in which you know applications have to go through and, and you know what you have to go. Inputs are controlled. You, you're not controlling the inputs or the timing of the inputs uh, there. So you know that's not feasible. There are areas within uh, games industry which can be automated. Things where you have a lot of these APIs, game engines, and testing those. That can certainly be done, but the end user experience is is very difficult to uh, automate. I, I'd rather say next impossible. Um, uh, I don't know whether SQ has tested any uh, real time online games. So uh, anything in that area? Well, such as could be slot games or real time we, uh, betting games. Or we we do a lot of that. We so do. then, how do you test the performance and the stress real time? Uh, but that's that's a completely different perspective. When when you talk about these uh, slots and betting uh, games, uh, you, you, there's still a lot of flash based games that are produced. Okay, flash again, and and they are like chance games. You you cannot predict the results there. Okay, but a lot of testing that we do is is at the back end. You know where where where. where Doing the testing through through XMLs or the APIs and things like that, so you make calls. There are also um, utilities that we build up where we can kind of simulate certain results just so that we we have an idea about all possible conditions can be met. Because if you're playing a game and, and trying to achieve a jackpot, it is a human. You know, it's it's just your luck. You know, you may end up winning a jackpot in five minutes, or you might end up playing five days and not still get there. So, you know, there are ways in which we have got utilities which which are automated, which help us kind of you know, achieve those results and, and make sure that we've met all the conditions that the game is supposed to either reward you or uh, penalize you. So, basically, it's mocking up stubs and then pushing in. Yes. Just one question, how does SQS come to know about the uh, product requirement? Are you given some formal documents uh, to go through it or is it just the game or the discussion? Yeah. So, interesting, I mean, on, on the games testing side, I've, I've generally seen that uh, they're quite uh, keen on not documenting too many things. Mm -hmm. uh, just the game has a prototype. Uh, from, from our perspective, the way we engage with our customers is, uh, there is perhaps an, uh, an alpha or a pre pre-alpha stage where they, they want us to come on board. From our side, we do invest in, in, in working with the customers a week ahead of when they want us to get uh, the testing started, which means we have a build or two on which we will do the familiarization. It is very clear with our customers that in familiarization phase, we are going to ask you any and every question about the game and, and you got to answer that because when you expect us to start putting in defects, you will want to know what is the right way the game is intended to be played. If you don't know that, then you're putting in DPEX, which are just a waste of time. They would look at it and say, yeah, works as intended, close it. Uh, so that's how we kind of you know, do that. Of course, if we get the game-related document, helps. But most of the times, our experience is they're perhaps a lot outdated than what the actual game looks at at the time it comes for testing to us. Yeah, the only, only document that we have seen all, this, all these years is a game design document, but as Amok said, Many a times it's, it's an outdated one. There are a lot of changes that have happened us. The other, other thing that you have to do as a testing organization, especially like us, is uh, you, we cannot work in isolation. We do tend to make sure that we, ha we do work with customers where there is a reasonable overlap with them uh, or their development teams. Where we try and understand you know, what they are going to do and what is it that they expect and things like that. Uh, it, it's otherwise very difficult to kind of you know, give them what they are looking out for. How many uh, test kits uh, do you have and what all hardware are you testing on nowadays? Uh, I mean, nowadays it's primarily mobile stuff that we are doing. Uh, on the mobile front, we've got almost 100 odd devices, uh, Apple, Android, Blackberry, etc. Like on the consoles, we've got uh, uh, PS3s, Xboxes, Nintendos, uh, all handled and uh, you know, all those kind of things. How many of them? Uh, I think we should have easily in between 250 to 300 uh, kits across all three platforms. And that's an expensive investment. Do you get that from the publisher or is that uh, owned by SQS? I mean, you've got to invest in it as well, you know. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, it, it is an investment that we make, uh, you know, with the projections that we have in terms of the business that we get from the publishers.
So on the business side, you're more happy with console testing or mobile testing? What seems more viable for you? Both of them. What do you want to give me? <laughs> <laughs> so both of them. I think as as I put down, check that you know we've, we've done a lot of work on consoles as well. Mobile is one thing that we've seen that it's been picking up over the last two and a half years. With the Pocket Gems is a uh, marquee customer for us. We've been testing their products for the last two years, and uh, you know <coughs> they've had a lot of success there. And on the console stuff, 2012 wasn't the best year that we have had, uh, but we've, we've had uh, some successful projects that we've delivered then itself. So, and then with all the devices that we have right now, uh, since we have already made that investment, console looks better. We do that, but, uh, but that's more from the technical perspective in terms of you know doing, doing uh, performance tuning, monitoring server side APIs and things like that. But but that isn't handled by Vijayan as well because uh, that we see more closer to the testing that we do in the enterprise world, and and that's where you know things like test automation, you know. Yes, absolutely. So that that's more seen like in a product testing kind of thing. That's, that's a big service of How do you test performance testing on mobile? Man in the corner, man behind you. That's perhaps it. Thank you, everyone. One uh, interesting thing that we uh, these guys didn't talk too much about, and uh, I can tell you as a producer, is that a uh, lot of feedback that comes in, you know, has actually changed the games that I worked on. I mean, it's like underwhelming the amount of attention these guys get. People think that they're just here, they just send lots of bugs, and you know, the programmers are just irritated by them and all. But gameplay wise and Everything, I mean, they have a very big impact, and trust me, uh, the biggest impact is on the overall user experience, right? How much can I do or you do as a programmer? How much can you know these people are literally spending countless hours grinding through the same game again and again, which is not fun at all, I think. You know, after a while, it might get boring, so. And they really, you know, make a big impact. So I think that we deserve another round of applause for the QA. So okay guys, we'll break now, uh, lunch will be served at 1, before that we can chill out, talk here and say hi to everybody on Facebook who's going to be saying this and Shruti, we miss you. <laughs> chill guys. Thank you.